Yeah. Yeah. Come on. <laughs> was the stickiest bit of tape I've ever had on one of these things. Asus did not want this box open. All right, come on. Hey, welcome back to Hardly Tech. Today we're going to be checking out the Asus Phoenix GeForce RTX 3060 Auto Extreme 12 GB GDDR6 Dual Ball Bearing 2 times Longer Lifespan GPU. Let's see what we've got in the marketing materials. 2nd Gen Ray Tracing Cores, 3rd Gen Tensor Cores, all that marketing bullcrap, G-Sync, V-Sync, Game Ready Drivers, blue blue blue. Axial Tech Fan Design, probably means they're quiet, right? Look at that. Super tiny. Full featured card though, 12 gigs of GDDR6, which is kind of unnecessary to be honest. But we'll see how performance is anyways. Let's get it open so we can uh, take a closer look. Uh, uh, come on. <laughs> was the stickiest bit of tape I've ever had on one of these things. Asus did not want this box open. Pretty hefty though. That's a dense card. Dang. Let's see what we got in the box. What's in the box? What's in the box? Looks like we got a basic user manual. Shows you how to set everything up. Multiple languages, pretty standard. A insert from Asus saying thank you. Warranty card, always useful. And whatever this is. Like a trading card or something, huh? All right, let's get this thing opened up, shall we? Bye bye. There we go. Look at that single fan card, beefy ass cooler, very nice single eight pin power connector. Nice fin stack, all right, I like that. Got some heat pipes, one more piece of plastic peel. Typical for this generation, three display ports and one HDMI. I like it, this is pretty nice. It looks like a, a pretty quiet fan, it's not very thick, but a very dense radiator, I like this. Looks like it's all aluminum, not sure about the contact on the CPU but pretty solid back plate it seems like. Feels like aluminum instead of plastic. I like that much better than the TI that I reviewed. And as a comparison, here's my old 1050 TI. So you can see the size difference here. Sandwich them up. Dang, this was a very good card for me. I used this for a while. Very low power, very awesome. And as a comparison to the TI that I reviewed, I, I could almost literally fit two of these in the same space that the TI takes up. Whew. Density wise though, the cooler is much thicker. So I'm interested in seeing just how good the cooling is on this thing and performance in general. I don't know how much of a split there will be between this and the TI, but this gives me hope that this will give it a good run for its money. So I took a closer look uh, down through the card at the heat pipe system and the, uh, the heat sink. And it looks like the heat sink is actually making pretty good contact with the MOSFETs and on the RAM. So I have a very good feeling about this card. I don't know why they needed 12 gigabytes on a 3060, considering six or eight would have been plenty, but I'm curious. How far can we push this on an overclock? That might be the last test we do. Anyways, see you in a bit. Hello again. I uh, didn't record putting the GPU in the case this time, but in case anybody was interested in seeing what it looks like compared to how the 3080 Ti and the 3060 Ti fit, there you go. This thing is tiny. I imagine this GPU would go really well in an SFF PC, like with a mini ITX or a micro ATX be a great fit. Anyways, there you have it. Probably gonna improve RAM temps compared to the 3080 Ti. Card makes my RAM run hot. Back in a flash. 
So for today's benchmarks, we'll be starting with Ray Tracing, first up is Metro Exodus Enhanced, then Doom Eternal, and Far Cry 6. Then we'll move on to standard rasterized gaming, starting with God of War, then Forza Horizon 5, and Halo Infinite. And then we'll move on to some more casual slash esport titles, starting with Diablo 2 Resurrected, then Counter-Strike Global Offensive, Fall Guys Ultimate Knockout, and Plants vs. Zombies Battle for Neighborville. Hi ho, hi ho, it's off to Metro we go. Here in Metro Exodus, we're playing with main settings at extreme, ray tracing set to ultra, DLSS on balanced, and reflections fully ray traced. Hairworks and physics are both on. With these settings here in Metro Exodus, 1080p and 1440p give us a constant 60fps plus. 4K, not quite, we're in the 40s. If you wanted to obtain a 4K 60 experience, I would say turn main settings down to high, or you could turn ray tracing down to high, and get yourself most of the way, if not all of the way there. Changing DLSS from balanced to quality drops performance quite a bit, even at 1080p, so I don't recommend it. Unless, of course, you want to drop ray tracing settings to high or medium. In either of these cases, you'd be dropping image quality quite a bit. I think this is a pretty good balance to get yourself solid performance and a nice looking game overall. If you're worried about this card heating up your case, don't worry. Mid-50s are the norm for this thing in all games that I've tested. Mind you, I'm using an 011 Dynamic, but even with a smaller case, I don't think this thing would reach over 60 very often. Doom Guy vs. Master Chief, go! In Doom Eternal, we're playing with ray tracing on, DLSS off, and using the Ultra Nightmare preset for all the settings. Doom Eternal at 1080p is very good. I think you could lock this to 120, no problem. 1440p is a little heavier on this game, but you're still getting a great experience. Dropping settings to Nightmare would probably get you up to that 120 FPS mark if that's your game. As for 4K, we're not quite hitting a constant 60, but again, if we dropped some settings down to Nightmare, we would probably hit that 60 FPS mark, no problem. ID has done a great job optimizing this game across a wide range of hardware, and this card is going to give you great performance no matter how you're playing. As far as power consumption, we're hovering between 160 and 170 watts for the most part. Temps never really reach above 56 Celsius on this thing, which is very good in my opinion. Especially in this day and age when 400 watt cards exist and heat up an entire room. As for noise levels, I can say this is probably the quietest card I've ever had in this build. Quieter even than the 3060 Ti that I reviewed recently. Anton Castillo sure is a dick. Tater, <laughs> I'll see myself out. Far Cry 6 is pretty heavy, so we're sticking with the high preset for the main settings, with ray trace shadows and reflections both on. Now, I hate to talk negatively about a game, especially when I haven't put a lot of time into playing it yet, but performance in Far Cry 6 is not good, and honestly, the game doesn't look that amazing for the performance cost. If you really want to play this game and get good performance, I would recommend turning off ray tracing and sticking with rasterized performance. Uh, you get about another 20 FPS across the board turning off ray tracing, and you don't lose much visual quality. I think a lot of this performance cost is coming from the long view distances and having a lot of foliage around the player that you can see, which is nice, don't get me wrong, but textures aren't great. Now, I'm not using the HD texture pack, but that would also cost a lot of performance as well, so I stuck with the regular textures, and this is what we got. As far as temps though, temps are very good. Mid 40s, sometimes up around 50, but not too high, and the, the fan at this temperature is not very loud at all. I would still recommend playing this game on this card, but I would say turn off ray tracing for sure. Boy, I sure am tired. We're keeping DLSS off in God of War, and we're sticking with the Ultra preset. 
Now you might be wondering why I chose this section of the game instead of something with heavy combat, and it's because there are a lot of reflections around the player, and there's a wide viewing area. So this gives us a kind of worst case scenario for God of War. As you can see, we're not quite maintaining 60 FPS when we're inside with reflections all over the place near Brock, but outside, it actually does pretty well. It maintains just about 59 to 65 frames per second for the most part. And of course, if I weren't recording, performance would be about two to four frames per second better. So we're basically at a constant 60 at 1080p. Moving up to 1440p, if you wanted to lock on to 60 FPS, I would recommend turning settings down to high. At 4K, however, even turning settings down to normal, I couldn't quite get 60 FPS in any situation. Oh, sorry, sorry. In Forza Horizon 5, we're once again sitting with full resolution, no scaling. All settings set to their maximum, save for anti-aliasing, set to 2x. Considering how new this game is and just how good it looks, 1080p in Forza Horizon 5 is pretty good. We're maintaining above 60 FPS pretty much all the time. At 1440p, we're kind of riding the border at 60 FPS, but if I wasn't recording, I'm pretty sure this would be a constant 60. 4K, however, to maintain 60, I think you'd have to drop some settings, but the game would still look gorgeous, so you wouldn't be losing much. This is also one of those situations where I've kind of pushed the graphics to where the card is kind of at its limit. We could easily drop anti-aliasing and gain a bit of performance. Join the UNSC, they said. See new places, they said. With Halo Infinite, I set the resolution through the desktop because I don't like using scaling in the game. It actually costs performance. Otherwise, all the settings are maxed out just to see what this card can handle. Similar to what we saw in Far Cry 6, I think the draw distances and the large amount of foliage in this game is kind of pushing this card to its limit. 1080p, we're getting basically 60 FPS locked, if I wasn't recording, of course. 1440p, we would have to drop some settings down to high, but to be fair, the game would still look and play great. 4K, however, we would have to drop some settings significantly to make up that performance. It is doable, but at that point, I think you'd probably be better playing this on your console if you have one. This is also one of those games that pushes VRAM usage above 8GB, and as you can see, the card just isn't quite powerful enough to maintain performance with all that VRAM anyways. Yes, we're finally in hell! Wait, did anybody bring a town portal? Performance in Diablo 2 Resurrected is actually pretty good with this card, so everything is set to maximum. I wasn't quite sure how Diablo 2 was going to run on this card, considering how hard it can push my 3080 Ti at 4K, but this card is actually doing an admirable job. At 1080p, we're locked at 120+. plus. 1440p, we're hovering between 85 and 95 FPS, but if we drop settings down to high or medium, we could easily maintain 120. At 4K, to hit that 60 FPS mark, same story. Drop some settings a little bit, and you're there. This is one of the few games that we see that having more than 8 gigabytes of VRAM is actually kind of helping at lower resolutions, but at 4K, the card just isn't powerful enough. Once we drop settings to maintain 60 FPS, that extra VRAM usage will go down too. They're at bomb site B. There's no bomb site. Oh sh. CSGO basically runs on a potato, so all settings are set to maximum, including anti aliasing at 8x. Like I jokingly mentioned, uh, Counter Strike Go basically runs on anything. We're getting about 360 FPS plus at 1080p, definitely 240 plus at 1440p, and you could easily maintain a 144 frame per second at 2160p. So all of your high refresh monitor needs are met with this card, and then some. And if you did have any performance problems, you could turn down anti-aliasing to 4 or 2 or even off and get even better performance. I mean, come on, what do you want? 480 frames per second? 600 frames per second? I mean, I kind of do. <laughs> and once again, even with such high frame rates, we can see that temps are very good. High 40s to mid 50s at the top end. So, uh, what happens to all the beans that don't make it? Fall Guys turned out to be a bit heavier than I thought it'd be, but all settings are set to their maximum, including reflections on Ultra.
Fall Guys surprised me a little bit. With how well it runs on PlayStation 4 and 5, I was kind of surprised to see that frame rates dip so low. But then again, there are a lot of people playing at the same time, so there's a lot of shading to render, a lot of reflections, a lot going on in general. Once the crowd thins out a little bit though, performance increases quite a bit. At 1080p, we start around 60 FPS with all the people on screen, and then we shoot up to around 180. So you could probably lock this on a 144Hz screen, 1440p around 120 max, and at 4K, you're lucky to hit 60, but turning down settings would easily fix this, and the game would still look amazing. So, have fun. Brains, not broccoli. Similar to Fall Guys, Battle for Neighborville is actually a bit heavier than I thought it'd be, but we're still maxing out settings, everything on Ultra. This is probably one of the cutest franchises I've ever played, and it's great to play with friends or family, so maintaining at least 60 FPS at 4K is pretty impressive to me. At 1080p, we're easily hitting 144, probably closer to 165 when not recording. At 1440p, for the most part, we're maintaining at least 100 to 120 FPS. Turning shadows down to high would probably fix the loss in frame rate down from 120. At 4K, we're just about 60 FPS locked, but if you're having trouble maintaining, I would say turn shadows down to high, and maybe turn down cloth to high as well. Alright, so here we are at the end. Time to gather our thoughts and consider the pros and cons of the 3060 12GB from ASUS. I think this is a great card, honestly. Um, at an MSRP of $499.99, or 500 bucks, this is pretty good performance for your dollar. I mean, this isn't the days of the 9600 GT, you know, it's not that good, but it is definitely good. And when you compare it to the MSRP of the 3060 Ti Ventus 3X, which is at $650, it's kind of hard to say go for the 3060 Ti, especially if you're on a budget. As far as performance, that extra 4GB of VRAM over the 3060 Ti, well, it doesn't hurt. But when you're playing at 4K or 1440p, and you're using more than 8GB of VRAM, you're generally still limited by what the card is capable of, concerning its CUDA cores and its ray tracing cores. So, yes, it helps, but it doesn't help enough. However, I do think NVIDIA is onto something here, because if the 3060 Ti, the 3070 or the 3070 Ti had 12GB of VRAM available instead of 8, I'm pretty sure it would help their performance across the board, because there are situations where those cards are running out of VRAM before they're running out of CUDA core performance. From a casual gaming perspective and from an eSport title perspective, this card offers generous performance. Counter-Strike, Fall Guys, Rocket League, Plants vs. Zombies, Fortnite, they all ran great. Stuff like Minecraft or Terraria or any other game that isn't a heavy AAA modern title is going to perform at or above 60 FPS at pretty much every resolution. You may not be able to max out every setting, but it will be able to play it. Ray tracing isn't this card's strong suit, but I was pretty impressed at how capable it was if you're willing to concede on some settings, turning down reflections from like ultra to high, etc, etc. This card is very capable and at a good price. The other aspect of this card to consider is that it runs at a very low temp, especially for today's line of GPUs from NVIDIA and AMD. 45 to 55 degrees Celsius on the core? That's nothing to scoff at. It's like having some ice cold tea on a hot summer day. It's gonna keep the rest of your system cool. And this isn't even exaggeration. Using my 3080 Ti, my RAM runs at about 48 to 51 degrees Celsius at peak gaming temps. With this card installed, I peaked at about 38 to 41 degrees Celsius. That's a huge difference. And all of this being cooled with a single fan that's quieter than everything else in my system that has moving parts, of course. So yeah, this definitely gets a recommend from me. Even recommended over the 3060 Ti that I reviewed. Unless, of course, you got the extra money and you really do need those extra frames. In which case, I would honestly say just get a 3070 if you can. And if anybody's wondering how productivity is with this card, I used this GPU to edit my previous video, giving us the preview and this video. And while it wasn't as fast as the 3080 Ti for editing videos, it's still very capable. I didn't have any real issues, took a few minutes more here and there, but nothing that I couldn't live with if I didn't have the other card. Alright, well, I think this outro's gone on way too long already, and this video's gonna be like 20 minutes, and it's gonna be about a day late. Sorry, 
Uh, it took longer to put together than I thought it would. But I hope you liked this video. I hope you found it useful. If you did, hit that like button for me, please. And consider subscribing all over that button. It would really help my channel out. Because none of these products are sponsored. And I love what I'm doing, but I need you guys' help. All right, end of spiel. Have a great day, everybody. You're all cool people, and I hope to see you on the next one. Bye.